Hello, I'm Dr. Ann Zychek. I'm the Program Director for the Office of Clinical Research Education and Collaboration Research in the Office of Intramural Research, Office of the Director at NIH, and I will be speaking about the FDA and specifically about the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, fondly known as CEDAR. Uh, the topics I wanted to include are um, an overall overview of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, the Code of Federal Regulations, real briefly, uh, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, also known as CBER, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, CEDAR, communicating with the FDA and FDA inspections. So uh, this is a screenshot from the uh, FDA uh, website. And the part that I wanted to point out are, first of all, it's a very big agency. Um, it's part of the Department of Health and Human Services, as NIH also is. Um, and the three areas that probably will affect anyone doing clinical trials are the ones in the blocks. So there's a Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, which is CBER. Um, that concerns uh, biologics, obviously. The Center for Devices and Radiological Health, uh, CDRH, and uh, that's again, is related to uh, regulation of devices and uh, radiology uh, equipment. And Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, CEDAR, which is uh, mostly what we'll be discussing is our uh, communications and interactions with CEDAR. So, in CEDAR, um, there's a director and there are numerous offices and the ones having to do with drug trials and uh, regulation of drugs is the Office of New Drugs. So that is who you'll be communicating with. Within the Office of New Drugs, there are a variety of offices and their sub uh, review divisions. So offices and then review divisions under them. I included a link um, about the offices and the div divisions that are under there. Um, so for example, I'm a pediatrician, so I had a lot of interaction with the Office of Pediatrics and then within the Office of Pediatrics, uh, the Division of Maternal and Child Health, for example. Um, so these are the overall offices and then within them are the review divisions having to do with more specifics. So, as I mentioned, these are review divisions, and the people who work in these review divisions are reviewers. And there are five different uh, categories of reviewers within each of those review divisions. Uh, there are medical reviewers who review for the safety and efficacy of the agent that is being tested. There are statisticians who are involved with determining whether your trial uh, is sufficiently powered. Clinical pharmacology, uh, which looks at whether you're using the appropriate dose and the relationship between dose, exposure, and response. Um, when I worked at FDA, I was a clinical pharmacology reviewer, so this is what I am very familiar with. Um, there are reviewers for pharmacology toxicology called PharmTox, and these are uh, people that look for uh, preclinical toxicology information. And then people dealing with chemistry, manufacturing, and controls, or CMC, having to do with drug manufacturing. Now, in communicating with an FDA review division, your first question is, are you studying a drug or a biologic? And although this seems pretty obvious, it's not obvious. Um, there are different categories. Sometimes they're combination products. Sometimes you think something that is a drug is actually a biologic. And so what you need to do is to talk to somebody at the FDA. So the first question would be, what review division will you be working with? And again, that gets back to the previous slide of, are you looking at an infectious disease agent, um, a cardiovascular agent, and so on? You will locate those people at this link and the specific person that you will be communicating with at FDA is the program manager. So this person is typically a pharmacist and this will be your, your liaison, your communication avenue between yourself and the review division. And this program manager is invaluable because she or he uh, will be able to direct you to 
uh, again, the major question, are you dealing with a drug or a biologic? And then which review division and what person should you be communicating with in that review division? So this link for the CEDAR review division is extremely helpful. And again, the program manager is completely invaluable. Um, I wanted to point out that the FDA is a regulatory body. And this means that everything that the FDA does is within the code of federal regulations. These are links. And uh, in the code of federal regulations, there are numerous number, numerous titles and FDA is title 21. And this will explain exactly what the FDA does and any kind of information that you would like to have about the FDA, just for background. Now, after you get a hold of the person at FDA who is in the review division that you're interested in submitting to, you the question, the first question you have to ask them is, do you need an IND or investigational new drug application? And so again, I thought this was pretty obvious. It's not obvious. Um, if you look at uh, 21, again, that Title 21 Code of Federal Regulations, Section 312.2, there is a listing of exemptions for reasons that you would not need an IND. And otherwise, you should be able to figure out whether you need one or you don't. Um, I have had several experiences with the FDA where I thought I would need an IND, but I did not need an IND. So again, it's important to ask the FDA via email, do you need an IND or do you not need an IND? But again, this is a question for the FDA. Okay, these are some uh, famous FDA forms. So I wanted to mention these. Uh, there's a form 1571, which is the investigational new drug application. There's a 1572, which is a statement of the investigator. And this is the link to clinicaltrials.gov, which we will get to in just a second. Okay, this is the form 1571. Um, this describes who the sponsor is. I should mention that whoever the IND holder is, it does need to be a physician, a licensed physician. Um, there are questions about whether this is a rare disease because this puts this in a whole different category in terms of review, but this asks for some very bread and butter information about um, what your project is about when you were applying for an investigational new drug application. So again, this is Form 1571. Now, when you apply for the uh, IND, You'll be submitting this via email. And the FDA has a 30 day time clock to make a determination about whether your protocol is good to go or whether it's placed on clinical hold, meaning that the FDA has some unanswered questions for you and you will need to speak with FDA and work out what your answers are. So what gets tricky for the investigator is that you may not hear from the FDA. And if you don't hear from the FDA, that means you can go ahead, but it's sort of unnerving to be waiting for the 30 days and then worrying, well, did they send an email, but you didn't get it and so on. So this gets a little unnerving, but again, these are the rules. I agree not to begin clinical investigations until 30 days after FDA's receipt of the IND. Okay, and again, otherwise you'll get a note which typically is around day 29, saying that uh, you're on clinical hold. Okay, and then there's form 1572, which is a statement of the investigator. And this agree, this is the statement that the investigator, you um, understands uh, what you can do and can't do as the investigator. So the third form that I wanted to mention is clinicaltrials.gov. So in the FDA Amendments Act, there is a requirement that all trials, all clinical trials be registered on the clinicaltrials.gov registration website. The clinical trials website is from the U.S. Library of Medicine, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. 
Um, there's a requirement to register the trial within 21 days of first patient enrolled. And what you get from them is an NCT number. Now, in that Form 1571 that I mentioned, the previous iteration required an NCT number in order to apply for the IND. That element is not there anymore. But uh, in some cases, you may need that NCT number uh, for your institution to start the clinical trial, not within 21 days of first patient revolt enrolled. And um, the clinical trials website, um, it's not a vending machine. So you have to understand that you're going to submit your information regarding the protocol and the primary endpoints, secondary endpoints, and so on. But there's a team of people that's going to review that. So there may be some back and forth. So just because you submit information to clinicaltrials.gov for an NCT number does not mean that you're going to instantaneously get it. Um, so please, my advice to you would be to apply for this NCT number very early in the game, perhaps at the time that you're submitting your IND so you don't get stuck start at wanting to start the trial but not having an NCT number. Okay, so after you've submitted all this, you filled out the paperwork, you need to request a pre-IND meeting. Now you can do this without a pre-IND meeting and that's fine. My advice would be that you want some back and forth with the FDA. So you can request either an in-person meeting or you can request um, that FDA respond to your uh, meeting request and the questions that you have by email. Um, most of the meetings that they're having right now, my understanding is they're by email. So you're welcome to request an in-person meeting, but it doesn't mean they're going to get one. There are three types of meetings, type A, B, C. A is that there's an emergency going on. Um, in the Code of Federal Regulations or in the FDA website, it's stated that type A is to help with stalled product development. And that's one way to put it. But the other way is that if there's some catastrophe going on where you've got to talk to the FDA immediately, that's a type A meeting. And there's a 30 day time clock on that. So that means that when you request the type A meeting, you will be you will be seeing the FDA somewhere within that next 30 days. The type B meeting is another type of pre-IND meeting. It's for um, either the end of phase one or phase two or pre-NDA or new drug application meeting, which would more typically be for um, people from the pharmaceutical industry. And the FDA has 60 days to schedule that. Uh, the most common type is type C, which is neither A nor B, and they're 75 days. Um, so that's, that's quite a long time. Um, when you put the package together that would have the protocol, you want to ask the FDA specific questions and give specific answers that you would like FDA to respond to. Be as specific as you can, um, because you're probably going to be getting an email response. And if there's any confusion about what you asked, if you weren't specific enough, you're going to get an answer that's not going to make any sense to you, and you're going to have to go back to the drawing board again and ask for another meeting. Um, one example um, might be our primary endpoint is an improvement in FEV1. So that would be an example of a bad specific question because it's not specific. You want something as specific as absolutely possible um, in order for the FDA to either agree or disagree. Um, so that would be my advice. Again, request the pre-IND meeting so you can get things on the table. Make sure that you're clear and the FDA is happy with your protocol and your primary endpoint and the statistics and so on. So you've uh, you've done your trial and then the you get a note from the FDA that they want to come and look at your site. And this would be uh, Form 482. You get from the FDA a notice of inspection. Um, and then there's a Form 483 that you hopefully won't, but you may get at the end of the inspection called Observations from the Inspection. 
Now, the thing that's a little um, unnerving about this is that if you if there are observations, meaning that you have failed the inspection or the audit in some way, these observations are public and I will show you. So this is for Abbott Laboratories. This is public, founded on the web. Um, so Abbott is in the midst of having some problems with manufacturing baby formula. And this is a screenshot of part of their 483 from the FDA explaining that um, they had some problems with manufacturing infant formula. Now, the purpose of the FDA inspections could be either for cause, meaning that they know that something's wrong and they want to uh, verify what that is, or not for cause, that your study, they were interested in making sure that your study results were correct. And the overall point of these inspections is to find out whether your trial was done according to good clinical practice, otherwise known as GCP. So the goals of good clinical practice are to protect the rights, safety, and welfare of human, humans participating in research, to ensure the quality, reliability, and integrity of the data collected, and to provide standards and guidelines for the conduct of clinical research. And good clinical practice is basically the synthesis of ethics and quality data. And there are 13 general principles of GCP, ethics, ethical conduct of clinical trials in accordance with the Declaration of Helsinki, the benefits justify the risks, the rights, safety, and well-being of subjects prevail over interests of science. For protocol and science, non-clinical and clinical information support the trial. There was compliance with a scientifically sound and detailed protocol. For responsibilities, the IRB approved uh, the protocol prior to initiation. Medical care and medical decisions are made by a qualified physician or dentist. Each individual is qualified by either education, training, or experience to perform his or her tasks. In informed consent must be given freely by every subject prior to participation. Also, parenthetically, um, the study subject signed uh, the most updated version of the informed consent form. Sometimes there are changes made and they need to be re-signed. Uh, data quality and integrity. There was an accurate recording reporting, handling, interpretation, verification, and storage of data. There was protection of confidentiality of records. Um, investigational products conform to current good manufacturing practices and used according to the protocol. And lastly, quality control and quality assurance symptoms, excuse me, systems with procedures to ensure quality of every aspect of the trial. So when you receive this 482 that they're going to come, the FDA is going to come and perform an audit. Uh, this has been my experience uh, running clinical trials uh, is that uh, the highest enrolling site is probably the most likely to get uh, audited. And that makes sense. Uh, this is the site that's gonna be responsible for uh, a majority of the statistics that go into making a determination about whether the drug was safe and effective or not. Uh, were enrollment criteria met. So the people that you enroll, did they meet the, meet the enrollment criteria? They will review the primary endpoints and related data. And they will also want to know if you performed assays that were per relative, excuse me, relevant uh, to the question, were the assays validated per good clinical practice? And I have a big note on here about saving your data. So I was responsible for, um, when I was branch chief at Child Health, the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act. The point of that act was to um, perform clinical trials in children for FDA labeling. And when we had audits of the sites, which FDA routinely audited, um, it was important that given our uh, turnover of staff, uh, changes in data storage, locating data, that there was some sort of chain of handing off 
the data on a disk, on a thumb drive, on a computer, however you had it in the first place. So that when FDA comes on, you know, giving you usually a day or two warning that you can actually locate the data, because if you can't find the data, then the whole study is null and void. So please save your data and be sure to have some means of transferring that data so that if there is a turnover in your staff, somebody can locate the data. In summary, there are many processes in place to ensure adequate human subjects and clinical trials oversight. It's critical that you incorporate good clinical practice principles into the conduct of your clinical trials. And please find a way to save your data so that if you leave your institution, if your nurse leaves the institution, you can locate your data. Thank you very much and good luck.